Welcome to the Tipping Point program. I'm Mark Hitchcock, and on today's episode, I'm going to be talking about a little bit more about Ezekiel 38 and 39, this a very important prophecy uh, that we see uh, the stage being set for today. And in our subscriber portion, I want to answer some questions as well as respond to the news about some uh, different uh, technological developments, especially related to central bank digital currency. So uh, be sure and join us uh, for that part of the program. Well, I want to talk about Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, this is a, are two chapters that are very important today, I think, as we see uh, the, the prophetic landscape developing um, in our world. Um, we've talked about this a lot. I know uh, Jimmy Evans has talked about it a lot. Greg Laurie's talked about it a lot. It's very important, obviously, in light of Russia's invasion um, of Ukraine. But I want to revisit this because there, there are a lot of developments just in the last couple of weeks that I think, again, are, are, are foreshadows of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, a lot of you probably know a great deal about these two chapters. Some of you may not vote, know very much. So let me just go back and just give a little bit of context and uh, so that, that the things I say about current events will, will make even more sense and have more impact. Um, Ezekiel 38 and 39 are in this last section of the book of Ezekiel, this restoration section of the book. Um, Ezekiel in uh, chapters 1 to 24 has been giving the judgment against Judah back in that day. The Babylonians are going to come and take them into captivity. In chapters 25 to 32, he talks about God's judgment on the near nations, uh, the near nations around Judah in the time of the Babylonians. But um, in chapter 33, Ezekiel in Babylon gets news that Jerusalem has been destroyed and uh, has, been, has been taken. And so from that point on in the book, he begins to look to the distant future, to the ultimate restoration of the Jewish people to their homeland. And chapter 37 of Ezekiel is one of the great chapters in the Bible about the final restoration of the Jewish people uh, to their land right before the end times unfold. It's the great uh, chapter about the, the dry bones. And again, I think we're seeing today the uh, partial fulfillment or the progressive fulfillment of Ezekiel 37 as the Jewish people just continue to come back to, uh, to their land. And again, this is the, the, the most important prophecy because it sets the stage for these other prophecies to be fulfilled. Because obviously when we get to Ezekiel 38 and 39, which is a Russian Islamic invasion of Israel, well, Israel can't be invaded if the Jewish people aren't there. So that's the first precondition, is Israel being back in their land. And then Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 1, says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog. Now, Gog is the, the leader of this coming invasion. Uh, the word Gog, we're not sure what it means. It may mean high or exalted. I mean, it may mean darkness. Uh, but Gog will be the leader of this invasion. And again, if this invasion occurs within the next decade or two, certainly Vladimir Putin could be Gog. We don't know. Uh, but as I've mentioned before, Joel Rosenberg says he certainly is Gog-esque. Um, he's Gog of the land of Magog, which uh, Magog is uh, the southern part of Russia, may include Ukraine. Um, the Prince of Rosh, which I believe Rosh there is Russia. Then Meshach Tubal, and prophesy against him. Meshach and Tubal are in modern day Turkey, uh, the central part of Turkey. And say, thus says the Lord God, I'm against you, O Gog, the Prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you about, put hooks in your jaws. I'll bring you out. All the army, horses, horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler, shield, all of them wielding swords. Persia, that's Iran. The name was changed from Persia to Iran in 1935, and now it's known as the Islamic Republic of Iran. Ethiopia, that's Kush um, in ancient Hebrew. That's the land south of Egypt, it's modern Sudan. And then Put was the land west of Egypt, it's modern day Libya. All of them with shield and helmet. Gomer, with all its troops, Gomer is also <clears throat> in modern day Turkey. Beth Togarma, uh, Beth Togarma, the house of Togarma, is in the eastern part of modern day Turkey. Notice from the remote parts of the north, with all its troops, many peoples uh, with you. So these nations mentioned here, kind of the outer ring of nations of Israel's enemies, it could include nations within that, but at least these specific nations here are part of uh, this invasion of Israel. And what's happening right now, Russia and Iran and Turkey are meeting in Iran. And I call these nations really the, the triple threat. This is the, the, uh, the terrible trio here in the Gog Magog prophecy. This is the triumvirate of evil. You have Russia, which is here Rosh and Magog. 
you have Iran, which is Persia, and you have Turkey, which is Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, and Tagarma. So seven of the 10 proper names mentioned here in Ezekiel 38 encompass what we know today as Russia, Iran, and Turkey. And so they're, they're meeting right now as I speak um, in uh, Tehran. Um, Turkey's uh, President Recep Erdogan will be there to meet with, uh, with Vladimir Putin of Russia. Now, what we've seen in Ukraine is very consistent with what the Bible says about Gog of the land of Magog in the end times. This aggressive behavior, this expansionist behavior, taking a, a, a neighboring country. Uh, many believe that, that Putin, if he's able to take Ukraine, which it seems to me like he will just over time, just a, a long drawn out grinding, just withering campaign. Some say he may try to move into Moldova or some of the other nations there that are not part of uh, a part of NATO. But we've seen that happening. We've all talked a lot about how that's uh, a, a setup or a foreshadow of what Ezekiel in 38 and 39 predicts. But when you see Russia and Iran and Turkey all meeting in Tehran, this should send off the, the red flashing signals about the gathering of this Gog uh, coalition. Um, all three of these nations, Russia, Iran, and Turkey, are also very involved in Syria. That's going to be a lot of what they're going to talk about there is their involvement um, in Syria, which obviously is right on uh, the northern border uh, of Israel. Uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, is, this is his first visit since the Ukraine invasion uh, happened. It's his first visit to a foreign country um, in a long period of time. Um, you know from, uh, from Jimmy Evans' report last week that Russia is seeking surveillance as well as armed drones uh, from Iran. So again, the ties between these nations are just being uh, cemented uh, more and more. Um, Vladimir Putin, while he's there, is going to meet with the Iranian Ayatollah, who is, who's the real power of the nation. Uh, the, the president there is a man named Raisi. So you have President Raisi, you have Vladimir Putin, and then you have Erdogan, who's the leader of Turkey. But Vladimir Putin's gonna meet with the, the Iranian Ayatollah uh, Khamenei. And uh, just this week as well, Iran themselves have come out and said that they're able now to produce a nuclear weapon. So all of this is happening here at the same time. And this is really the, what I would call you know, the, the, the Gog coalition that we see primarily coming together. Because the other nations mentioned here um, nations like uh, uh, Put or Libya and Ethiopia, which is Kush, which is Sudan. Uh, these are kind of smaller players really within this God coalition. Then the main uh, triple threat here is Russia, it's Iran, and it's Turkey. These are uh, these three uh, key players that are coming together. On uh, July the 19th, again, which is uh, today as I'm giving, as I'm speaking this video, it, there's going to be the seventh meeting of the top level Turkish Iranian uh, Cooperation Council. So they're meeting for the seventh time. This is a top level meeting called the Turkish Iranian Cooperation Council. So Turkey, Iran, Russia, uh, these three nations meeting together with this God coalition. Now, I want to just make one comment here. I want to, there's something else I want to talk about related to current events that's very important that's developing. But I want to talk about uh, something else for a moment, and that is when is this Gog, Magog invasion going to take place? It tells us, look, Israel's going to be regathered to their land in the end times. At some point in time when Israel's regathered, these nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey are going to invade Israel. They're going to come to wipe Israel out. Bible prophecy teachers disagree greatly on the timing of this invasion. In fact, there's been six different time periods within the end times uh, that this invasion has been placed, all the way from before the rapture to the end of the millennial reign of Jesus. Um, again, I won't have time in this video to go into all the different reasons, but I've mentioned this before, but I just want to say this again because I think it's important in this context to say that I think this will happen during the first half of the coming seven-year tribulation period. Many others believe it'll happen before the tribulation, maybe before the rapture, and certainly that's possible. But we have a couple of, of clues, a couple of chronological clues in Ezekiel 38. It tells us that when this invasion happens, obviously the main precondition is Israel's back in their land. They're living securely in their land. So the precondition, first one is they're there. The second one is, it says they're, they're living prosperously. Uh, they're prospering greatly. Well, that's been fulfilled as well. Israel's a prosperous nation. But the third precondition is it says they're going to be at rest and they're going to be living securely. 
Now, some would say, well, you know, Israel's at rest and secure today. I um, you know, I was just over there uh, two years ago. Um, you go to Israel, you feel very safe there. Uh, we plan on uh, taking a group there next March, uh, Lord willing. Uh, so we go there because we consider it to be a safe place. But when it says here in Ezekiel that they're going to be at rest and living securely, I would say that the, the, the Jewish people today in Israel are hardly at rest. I mean, they're on high alert constantly with uh, the enemies that surround them, especially Hezbollah in the north and Hamas and the threats they're receiving uh, from Iran. So it seems to me that this invasion will occur while Israel has their guaranteed peace from the Antichrist. You know, the event that starts the seven-year tribulation is the Antichrist makes a peace treaty with, with Israel, some kind of guaranteed uh, safety for them. It, it evidently allows them to either rebuild their temple or to offer sacrifices there uh, on that temple mount. So it seems to me that that fits best when Israel's at rest and living securely. That's when this invasion will take place. Now, again, many people would say it's going to happen even before the rapture. It could happen any time, which would make what I'm talking about here today even more urgent or imminent. But I see more stage setting that will take place. The rapture will occur. When the rapture occurs, the Antichrist will come on the world scene as the great peacemaker. He'll broker this treaty with Israel, the seven-year treaty. And sometime during that first half of that three and a half years of this guaranteed peace, uh, Russia, Iran, Turkey, and these other nations will come down into Israel. And it'll be an attack on Israel, but at the same time, it will also be an attack on the Antichrist and these Western powers because they're going to be in, in treaty with Israel. So it's going to be a subtle attack on them as well. And of course, you can go on and read Ezekiel 38 and 39 and find out how uh, these, these armies, when they invade Israel, are going to be supernaturally wiped out by God. Well, back to, back to the current events now. We, we see that the Gog coalition and how it's, it's being cemented together more and more every day with Russia, Iran, and Turkey. But further on in Ezekiel 38... Down in verse 13, we find out about another coalition of nations. Now, these nations are not the attackers. We could call them the objectors. So there's a group of nations listed here that object to this Russian, Iranian, uh, Turkish alliance invading Israel. Down in uh, verse 13 of Ezekiel 38, it says, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all its villages will say to you, that is, they'll say to Gog, to Russia and these nations invading Israel? Have you come to capture spoil? Have you assembled your company to seize plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to capture a great spoil? So there's gonna be three different groupings that are mentioned here, Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish. They're gonna to say to Gog, are you coming to capture spoil? Are you coming to take away cattle and goods? So they don't get involved. They stay on the sidelines, but nevertheless, uh, they're, they're giving what I, I refer to as kind of a lame protest uh, to what's taking place. So we have Sheba, we have Dedan, and we have these young lions of Tarshish. Now, if you uh, read the, the Old Testament, Sheba is mentioned a little bit over 30 times um, in the Old Testament. Um, it, it's Sheba. Sometimes people will say that the word Sabean also refers to those from Sheba. Probably the most common reference you may think of in your mind is remember the Queen of Sheba. The Queen of Sheba came to visit uh, King Solomon and see his great wealth and, and hear his wisdom. Uh, but Sheba is um, the area of Southern Arabia. It includes um, Saudi Arabia. Um, it may also include Yemen, which obviously is a place of great uh, turmoil today, with a lot of terrorist activity taking place in Yemen. But Sheba is fairly easy uh, to, uh, to identify. And uh, <clears throat> Sheba is mentioned um, several times, three times in the book of Ezekiel. This is just one of them here. But the next nation mentioned is Dedan. Dedan. Dedan is mentioned about 11 times in the Old Testament. Uh, mentioned four times in the book of Ezekiel. And again, Dedan, most scholars would say today, are, are the nations on the northwest coast of the Persian Gulf. So today, we would refer to those as kind of the, the, kind of the moderate Gulf states, kind of like uh, 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 Bahrain and, and uh, United Arab Emirates and, and those very Oman, uh, some of the uh, Qatar, some of these kind of more moderate uh, Gulf states that are there that, by the way, are in great conflict and very afraid of uh, Iran. And then it mentions uh, the merchants of Tarshish. 
And again, that's a, a little bit harder to identify the merchants of Tarshish. Notice it says with all of its villages, or some translations say, uh, and the young lions uh, thereof. So we have this Gog coalition, primarily Russia, Iran, Turkey, that we see coming together. But I believe today as well, we see what we might call the Sheba coalition, Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish uh, coming together as well. Let me uh, read just something for you. I've got a, a book I wrote a few years ago called Russia Rising. Um, it's a book that's all about, about Ezekiel 38, 39, Gog, Magog. Um, let me just read uh, what, I, what I wrote in here, a couple of thoughts that may be, may be helpful to help you understand this better. It says, the opposition here is described in Ezekiel 38, 13 as Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish. And it says, notice here that these nations don't do anything they just question what's happening. So they're not active in this. They're just on the sidelines giving a protest. Their mild protest doesn't change anything. They question the motivation and purpose of the invasion. And I, I say here, this looks frighteningly similar to the passive reaction we often see from the United Nations and nations in the West to international aggression. They kind of say, what are you doing? And they kind of give a protest to it, but they don't really take any uh, real solid action. Um, three specific places are listed as the source of the opposition, Sheba, Dedan, and Tarshish. Sheba and Dedan are easy to identify. They refer to nations on the Arabian Peninsula and along the Persian Gulf. Uh, Walter Kaiser, some of you may know that name. He's a great uh, Old Testament scholar. He says that Sheba and Dedan are usually identified with people living in the Arabian Peninsula, including Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, Kuwait, and the United Arab Emirates. And again, most of these nations, as you, you probably know, are under moderate Sunni Arab regimes who oppose the more militant strains of Islam, especially uh, the radical Shiite Islam that's, that's uh, found currently in Iran. Now, Tarshish is a little bit more difficult to identify with precision. The identification is complicated by the mention of all the villages. That's why the New American Standard translates it. Tarshish and all the villages, or the King James says, and all the young lions. Um, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, who's a, another Old Testament scholar, he says, the phrase is a Hebrew idiom, meaning nations that have come out of Tarshish. So Tarshish and the young lions thereof, or Tarshish and its villages, would be the nations that came out of Tarshish. Now, to complicate this even further, two places in the ancient world are identified as Tarshish, Spain and England. If Tarshish is Spain, the nations that came from it obviously would include a lot of Central and South America, except for Brazil, these nations that were formed through uh, Spanish colonization. If the location of Tarshish is England, it would include the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, the nations that came out of um, England. Um, the, the name Tarshish, though, is used in ancient times to just denote the farthest place to the west. So it's probably best, I think, to identify Tarshish with the western nations of Europe, possibly even the United States. Remember when Jonah was supposed to go to Nineveh, he fled to Tarshish, which was a Phoenician colony in, uh, on the coast of Spain. In other words, it was as far west as you could go. Now, some people say, well, the farthest west you could go in that day would have been places even like the United States. And uh, they'll see Tarshish and the young lions thereof as, a, as an identification of the U.S. And they'll say, look, this is the United States and Saudi Arabia and these moderate Gulf states uh, that we see in, in relationship today. Now, that's certainly possible. But what I would say is any identification here of, of the young lions of Tarshish with America um, is tenuous, I think, at best. So I think it's just referring here to these Western uh, powers. But what's interesting uh, to me is if you look at, um, you look at what's happening in, in our world today in, on this, in this light, uh, Haaretz, which is an a, a Israeli uh, a, a periodical headline that says, how Israel and Saudi Arabia plan to, to down Iranian drones together. Again, this is something unthinkable in the past. Saudi Arabia didn't even recognize Israel's right to exist. But it says the establishment of a joint aerial defense system for Israel and Gulf states against Iranian missiles and drones is on Biden's agenda visiting uh, the region this week. And it goes on to say in this article, the regional defense alliance 
that Defense Minister Benny Gantz and other politicians have been talking up in recent weeks. They've dubbed it MEAD, M-E-A-D, which is Middle East Air Defense. So what we see happening before our eyes is the same time that the GOG coalition is coalescing, Russia, Iran, and Turkey, we also see what we might call the, the Sheba coalition or the Tarshish coalition coming together as well, where you have Saudi Arabia, these more moderate Gulf states, entering into friendly relations with Israel through the Abraham Accords, and now what we see in the, the uh, growing relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel. And again, these Western powers, probably uh, designated here by Tarshish, that are behind all this as well, uh, with NATO and the EU and these other nations, and possibly uh, the United States being included in this as well. So you see both sides really are both of these coalitions coming together, the attackers, the attacking nations, but also the nations that are going to object to this. We see both of these things happening at the same time, which again, should be a strong indication to us that these events are not too far away from us on the horizon, which means the rapture must be even sooner. And so you and I need to be ready and keep looking up. Well, those of you uh, watching on uh, YouTube, be sure to subscribe uh, to this channel to be notified of, of all the latest content we have. We're going to now transition to our endtime.com subscriber portion of the show, where I'll be answering your questions as well as discussing some uh, current news articles. If you aren't an endtimes.com subscriber, you can join today for $7 a month or $77 a year. So just go to endtimes.com to sign up there, and I think you'll, uh, you'll be blessed by what you find. Thanks for watching our weekly Tipping Point show. If you enjoyed this show, leave a comment below and like and subscribe to our channel.